It's November 6th, 1971, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. It was today in history that British women could, for the first time ever, buy a pregnancy test to take themselves in their own homes. Although, if you're picturing the modern one-style test with a tidy graphic interface, park that image, because these earliest over-the-counter pregnancy tests were more like a miniature science lab. And only really available from your local pharmacy, not in Boots, Britain's biggest chain, because they were too conservative to stock it. And if you were a reader of which magazine, it was not being generally recommended. Um, they were still advising <laughs> their consumer savvy readers to go to the GP in the first instance in case the lady reader at home should clumsily misuse the test and waste two pounds. <laughs> I mean, you can almost understand why that was the public health advice that was being given at the time, given that in the 1960s, the only way to do a, a pregnancy test was to make a doctor's appointments, give a urine sample and wait up to two weeks for the results. But I suppose yeah. the thinking was at least you can be very, very confident that this has been touched by many professional hands and those hands know that they're delivering you true and accurate information. Well, I mean, it might have been more reliable to get the test from a doctor if the doctor would allow you to have a test, because this is the thing. Prior to the at-home test, the only way to get confirmation of pregnancy was from a doctor. But after the introduction of the NHS in particular, doctors were really reluctant to order tests for what they called cases of curiosity. (laughs) There was... It's so hard to imagine now where you think every single person who is pregnant wants to find out whether they're pregnant. (laughs) But at the time, most doctors considered them, quote, curiosity cases. It was a waste of NHS resources. (laughs) You wait until the baby pops out of you and then you'll find out if you're pregnant or not. (laughs) Exactly. It was only in an extreme minority of cases that doctors actually did order a pregnancy test. And it was for cases where there was thought to be some kind of medical risk or other overriding reason why a woman might have a good reason to want Mm. to know whether she was pregnant. As late as 1979, a doctor in Norwich wrote a letter to his MP complaining about a female patient demanding a pregnancy test out of what he termed idle curiosity. (laughs) Wow. And for that reason, (laughs) uh, women weren't going to doctor's surgeries and asking for pregnancy tests until this kind of era. So there is a rural GP that kept meticulous records in the UK Uh, that was interviewed by the feminist sociologist Anne Oakley in the early 1980s. And so he could look back through his uh, documents and say, well, this this is how many I was giving. His female patients in the late 1940s, 1.3% of them ever asked for a pregnancy test. And by the late 1970s, that had risen to 38.8%. So, you know, that's only one doctor in one region, but that's a 30-fold increase which is basically happening as the sexual revolution's happening, isn't it? So even though the technology wasn't there, there was obviously demand for more tests. Yeah. Well, it was the brainchild of a graphic designer called Margaret Crane. Just think about that, by the way, for a moment. (laughs) It was the brainchild of a graphic designer. I know. Talk about exceeding your brief. I was just thinking, like, she had been hired, (laughs) apparently, in 1967 by this company called Organon to work on a new cosmetics line. She she wasn't even meant to be in this department, but as she was going on a tour through this uh, pharmaceutical company, she noticed this line of test tubes that were standing over a mirrored surface, and she just asked what they were. She was just curious, and they said these are a form of pregnancy test, and the tubes are filled with urine that uh, spark against a reagent that would show a red ring that then reflected in the mirror could tell the scientist whether the woman in question was pregnant or not. And she just thought. That's so incredibly simple. This is something that every woman should be able to do herself. And this style of test was quite new because before then, for decades, the method used by the laboratories, because women weren't doing the tests at home, the doctors would send them away to the labs and in the labs they would do a test which now seems incredibly bizarre and I think has faded a lot from cultural memory, yeah. which was between 1927 and the mid-1960s, women's urine was injected f- uh, in the early years into mice and rabbits and later frogs and toads whose ovaries would change <laughs> if the hormone HCG, which is associated with pregnancy, was present. Yeah, well, they'd go on heat, basically, wouldn't they? Exactly. So thousands, if not m- hundreds of thousands, if not millions of animals are being used in these experiments, which sound... Well, they weren't experiments. They were tests because they they did have an accurate result, but it feels like something they were doing in, you know, ancient Greece. But so much so that the phrase, the rabbit died, became a euphemism for a positive pregnancy test. Okay. Can I tell a very quick story? <laughs> Go ahead. This is how I went down this whole rabbit hole in the first place. That, sorry. Rabbit hole. Did, oh, did, no, did no, mean no, to. Thanks. Please ignore that, guys. 
<laughs> I was watching the Dick Van Dyke show, one of my absolute favourite TV shows. And there is a scene, it's a classic sitcom, you know, character A thinks we're talking about this, character B thinks we're talking about this, where Robert Petrie, as played by Dick Van Dyke, th- mistakenly thinks that his wife has crashed their car while she's actually trying to reveal that she's pregnant. Complicated. But the wow. scene culminates with him saying, well, was anyone hurt? To which she replies, oh, well, rabbit the died. rabbit died. <gasps> and Whoa. then everyone erupts into gales of studio laughter. Like, but what? the punchline was universally understood at yes. the time. There are similar jokes on the Golden Girls, MASH, even as late as the Vicar of Dibley, there's a joke about oh, it. Really? But the, the whole the rabbit died thing was actually based on a misunderstanding because sadly all the rabbits died because they had to be surgically opened to check the yes. results of the test. How can you check a rabbit's ovary <laughs> <laughs> without exactly. killing a rabbit? Yeah. Well, weirdly, the whole business of uh, urinating or using urine to determine pregnancy uh, actually goes all the way back to ancient Egypt where women who suspected that they were pregnant would urinate on wheat or barley seeds and if the wheat grew they believed uh, it meant that the woman was having a girl and if the barley grew a boy and if neither plant sprouted she wasn't pregnant at all. And actually in 1963 they tested this theory and they found that 70% of the time the urine of pregnant women did promote growth in the seeds while the urine of non-pregnant women didn't. Come the thing on. about the wheat and the barley and the boys and girls didn't pan out yeah. but still for ancient Egypt that's not that's bad good. is it? Okay so back to Margaret Crane at Organ and Pharmaceuticals in the 1960s she's realised it would empower women to be able to do their own test at home and that that is the product that she should be designing not reworking their cosmetics graphics so she goes home and in her own kitchen basically starts constructing what she thinks should be a home pregnancy test how it should look because that's her background product design she's not a scientist and she assembles together a plastic paperclip holder a mirror a test tube and a dropper it all looks very sciencey mm. and she pitches it to the company and they say yeah you're right thanks we don't want that <laughs> but then the guy who runs the company goes off to holland and pitches it himself to someone else and gets an order <laughs> So then takes it back to his boardroom of men to develop the product and she gets uh, wind of the fact that this is going on behind her back and the New York Times piece that I found from 2016, which was kind of the first time her biography was really documented, described her as a real-life Peggy Olsen Mm. because what she did basically is crash the meeting. She went into the boardroom and she just sat at the table and sort of dared the guy to chuck her out, which of course he couldn't because he knew that it was her idea. Mm. It wouldn't actually be sold in the US until 1977 because there was a taboo around the at-home pregnancy test for several reasons. One of them was the proximity to legal abortion. You know, before then, the doctor almost acted as a guardian of the women because everything happened under the doctor's eyes. So you went to confirm you're pregnant and then if abortion was legal in your country, the doctor would also have to know about that. And if abortion wasn't legal, well, the doctor already knew that you were pregnant. So somebody Mm. powerful in the community knows that you're pregnant. That is obviously a legal risk as well. And so part of the opposition came from anti-abortion activists, but part of it came from good old-fashioned misogyny. The idea that women just were too dumb to be able to do this by themselves. There was a letter from a pharmacist published in the December 1971 issue of The Chemist and Druggist, which reads... As a pharmacist, I feel that in the best national interest, this product, talking about this first over-the-counter pregnancy test, should not be on sale to the general public. I can foresee grave errors occurring by women of subnormal intelligence or low educational standard due to their inability to understand and follow the instructions. That's such a bizarre reason to stop everyone else using it, though, isn't it? I mean, that goes for literally any drug, doesn't it? Yeah. This original product displayed a ring, a chemical reaction in the um, solution that told you whether or not you were pregnant after a couple of hours. But as the technology developed and it got a bit quicker to the kind of thing we have now where it just says pregnant or not pregnant, there was sometimes the smiling face of a baby. Mm. There was even one product that had a wiggling sperm on it, <laughs> which... It's kind of sort of cute emoji if you're an expectant parent who desperately wants mm. a baby. But of course, you know, possibly the majority of women using this product are checking because they don't want to be pregnant. Yeah, well, it was Clear Blue's pregnancy test in 1985 that really popularised pregnancy testing because these initial kits, they were quite fiddly and there was still a bit of a taboo around them. So Clear Blue simplified the process and it cut the wait time to 30 minutes. And then in 1988, it introduced the model that we know today, the One Step Wand, which finally made the process extremely simple and made it kind of you know the the social go-to for women who suspected they might be pregnant to get the test actually can i tell one more tv story Mm, please i was watching an episode of hill street blues (laughs) seriously that was the van dyke show and hill street i know (laughs) but it was broadcast in 1985 and a male character his girlfriend tells him that she might be pregnant 
And he says, I've heard about this thing you can do to find out at home <laughs> what you're going to ask the doctor about. Yeah. This is 1985. This is how slow it was really to become acceptable even after the technology was there. Piss on some wheat. That's how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, this episode first aired last year exclusively to members of Club Retrospectors. Join today and unlock a new episode this Sunday. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors! <laughs>